Um, I'll introduce our first speaker, which is uh, our illustrious co-chair, Jack Burns at the University of Colorado. Jack will be talking to us about radio science from the moon enabled by NASA commercial lunar payload services. So let me restart my timer video for you, Jack, uh, and we'll get started. Today, what I'm gonna do uh, this morning is to talk about a roadmap for doing radio science and radio astronomy from the moon uh, enabled by NASA's uh, CLIPS missions that are coming up. And a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about this morning was published just recently, a couple of months ago in a paper in the Planetary Sciences Journal. This is one of the uh, AAS uh, journals. I mean, we've talked about a number of, of um, manifested payloads as well as planned missions such as Farside, a radio array that you see a cartoon picture of uh, in the right side. So let's go right into the very first one. We're excited that just next spring, uh, NASA is gonna be flying its first radio science payload uh, to the moon called Rolls's. Uh, Bob McDowell's uh, talk was presented yesterday uh, on this mission in the space environment session. So I won't take a lot of that time because you can go back and, uh, and have a look at that um, talk. But I just wanna mention briefly, it's a simple instrument, uh, a couple of dipole antennas, one of three meters and another one perpendicular coming out of the page and into the page at one meter above the surface and a radio spectrometer that is uh, in the uh, interior. It's primarily a plasma experiment to uh, investigate the photoelectron sheath, the local ionosphere, if you will, that results from the interaction between the sun and the regolith. But also very importantly, uh, it's going to be a precursor for other observations uh, from the moon and particularly the far side to map out uh, the galaxy uh, in uh, detail um, and uh, to look at our instrumentation for future instruments. This will be followed in a few years uh, later by our first far side uh, instrument. This is Lucy, uh, and it's part of the, um, the payloads that will be on the Schrodinger uh, impact basin uh, landing that will be in 2025. Uh, what you see here are the uh, Lucy dipole antennas. And then this box on top is one that we proposed uh, called DAPR. Uh, the Dark Ages Polarimeter Pathfinder um, that we're discussing as an augmentation to Lucy uh, that will give us a longer, a larger bandwidth uh, from 10 megahertz up to 110 megahertz. Uh, Lucy is led by Stuart Bale uh, and uh, Rich Bradley at NRAO and myself are uh, co-investigators and investigators on DAPR. So the idea behind this uh, mission is this would be the first cosmological observations from the moon. Uh, and to give you an idea of what we're probing, it's literally the evolution of the universe. Down at the bottom here is a, a cartoon picture of that evolution of the universe going from the Big Bang on the left all the way on the right to today's universe at 13.8 billion years. The first um, observations of the universe occur at about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. This is when um, electrons and protons first combine because the universe is cooled and expanded enough to form neutral hydrogen. The uh, universe is transparent uh, at that point in time. Uh, and uh, we see observations of the cosmic microwave background, uh, including both US and European missions. Uh, this is also the beginning of what we call the dark ages. It's called the Dark Ages because this is before the first stars and galaxies form, but there's a lot of potential physics that's operating here. Uh, and the universe, as I mentioned before, is filled with neutral hydrogen. About 300, billion ye 300 million years later, um, the first stars begin to form. They're probably very massive. And when they turn on, you can see these little um, sort of purple regions. This is um, regions around the stars where the, uh, the ultraviolet light has ionized the hydrogen. Eventually, as more stars turn on, we go into this epoch of reionization in which we transform from what was an all neutral to an all um, ionized intergalactic medium. This makes for a very nice story. The problem is the story is untested because our best observations with Hubble only stick a toe into the cosmic dawn epoch. Uh, similarly, James Webb 
uh, but none of these will be able to probe the dark ages or the early stages of um, the, uh, the cosmic dawn. Uh, but again, there is a way of doing this, and that's using neutral hydrogen and the spin flip transition, uh, which is um, redshifted to low frequencies uh, below what we can see from the ground. So um, a lot of this is going to be discussed in upcoming talks um, that uh, we'll see in just a few minutes. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be able to probe that I think is very exciting is new exotic physics in what is now an unexplored epoch of the universe. The, uh, what we'll get out of the dapper Lucy payload is this spectrum. We won't be doing images with this, but a spectrum. Uh, think of this as radio power versus frequency. And these are various models of large absorption cloth that are expected. And new physics influences what we will see. For example, dark matter. Uh, being able to probe dark matter with these signals is very exciting because the dark matter, for example, if dark matter self annihilates or decays, as many models uh, expect it to, uh, that will show up. If there is non gravitational interaction between dark matter and baryons, that will show up. Uh, and then if there are different flavors of, of warm and cold dark matter, that will also potentially be viewable. Joshua Hibbard is going to talk more about that in a few minutes. So uh, next, after uh, Lucy Dapper, hopefully towards the middle and the end of this decade, we have proposed an array of radio telescopes. Uh, the engineering design study uh, for this was funded by NASA Astrophysics uh, and um, was partnered, partnered with JPL and uh, Greg, Al, uh, Greg Hallinan at Caltech as my deputy PI on this. Here's another cartoon picture. Um, the uh, spacecraft is a uh, graphics from our collaborator, Blue Origin. This is their uh, payload uh, lander that's capable of between two and five metric tons. We will bring four of these uh, rovers, these axle rovers from JPL, uh, and that will be used to uh, put out the um, antennas uh, and these tethers that will have power uh, and uh, communication. Uh, we'll certainly be doing um, cosmology with this, uh, but in addition, we'll also be observing uh, nearby exoplanets because those exoplanets that have magnetic fields, they emit low frequency radio emission. Um, and going down to the low end of our band near a couple hundred kilohertz, we potentially could measure those magnetic fields, uh, which may be important for habitability. Just show you a little bit about how we pack these things on here. Uh, again, a graphics on the Blue Origin uh, lander, the Blue Moon lander. Uh, we stack these four large uh, axle rovers. They're about 2.3 meters in length each. They're spring loaded, they pop open, uh, and then we lower them to uh, the surface. Um, this is what we hope to be able to see cosmologically, this is some simulation by Alex Hegedis, we'll be talking more about this. Um, on the uh, left-hand side, um, uh, the uh, right-hand side, rather, is uh, the uh, comparison between the truth and uh, what we expect to see here. Uh, and the agreement with, with these observations is rather good. So this is early structure. Uh, we expect to be able to see in the universe. Uh, and so the synthetic observations that we looked at so far uh, are in good agreement. Lastly, and just very briefly, um, recently we've been funded by NIAC, NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, to look at the ultimate array. So this is the last part of our roadmap, 100,000 dipoles. Uh, this is the ultimate cosmology telescope. But in addition, uh, what, we, what we plan to do is manufacture in situ the antennas using lunar regolith as feedstock uh, to uh, develop um, aluminum antennas that we will place on the surface along with the power systems. Just a kind of a cartoon picture of far side, which will be distributed in these uh, spirals, 256 of these uh, antennas versus 100,000 for uh, far view. So I will stop there. Uh, I, Marin, and just put up my summary and conclusions.
Great, thanks, thanks, Jack. Wonderful talk. So exciting to see all the stuff that's planned for the for the moon. I can't wait for the future. Um, we have time for a quick question, and there's one in the chat already. Uh, the question is from Michael Nord. Uh, what observations from Earth-based low-frequency telescopes can help prepare for the lower-frequency lunar observations? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, that's been happening for the last decade. So observations from the EDGES experiment uh, is a good example, which is a set stage and, a, and really a challenge to confirm um, uh, claimed observations that they have maybe of uh, Cosmic Dawn. So being able to, um, with uh, Lucy Dapper to confirm that uh, and extend that um, in um, uh, acquired environment on the far side uh, is very important. And then we've got arrays of radio telescopes, the MWA in Australia, the LWA in New Mexico and in California, uh, both are precursors uh, developing much of the technology and the software that will enable far side. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Jack.